Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Welcome to this episode of the Thriving Farmer Podcast. So this episode I've been wanting to do for a couple months now and finally was able to find a time that worked for me and Charles Pekka of Morningstar Farm. They are down outside of a Nashville, Tennessee area. And so Charles recently took a trip over to Korea to look at how they do tunnels and brought back a whole bunch of pictures and ideas and thoughts on how they are doing them and shared that with us on the episode. Charles also runs a very cool farm and does a lot of of tunnel growing as well as specializes in Korean vegetables, Um, does kimchi, sells at the farmer's markets. So very cool operation. It was a privilege to have him on. A couple big things we talked about, obviously, the entire Korean hoop house systems and so they have a three-layer system they use in their tunnels so we walked all the way through that exactly how that works he talked about how he set his farm up to be run by two 16 year olds and for them to just completely run the operation while he took the month-long trip to korea we also talked about his marketing we talked about what crops do well for him he's grafting melons. So we talked through that and how he does that, what kind of varieties he uses for that. So you're going to really enjoy this episode with Charles. I really appreciate him coming on and sharing his knowledge. So join me in welcoming Charles to the show. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Mike, for inviting me on. All right. Tell us a little bit about your farm. My farm is a 10-acre plot in which we started out as uh, just doing a little bit of market gardening. Okay. And it, it grew. Yeah. I had been in the military for 22 years and I traveled the world. Mm -hmm. And in those different different areas, like in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, I had an opportunity to see how some of the farmers there were actually feeding themselves and they're really big into hydroponics. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I'd give it a shot and I uh, converted one of the bays in my garage into a hydroponic grow room and I was just growing lettuce. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't grow enough to sell because everybody was buying it before I could get it completed. Mm. So then I went into a uh, 3,000 square foot uh, uh, commercial style greenhouse Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, both Dutch buckets and a uh, full NFT growing array for for salads. Mm -hmm. And that grew because they wanted uh, other supporting vegetables to go with their salads that I um, started tilling in the ground again outside the greenhouses. And then I went and got a uh, high hoop that I qualified for through uh, USDA. Okay. And now I'm in the process of getting a third one. So right now I got 5,000 square feet under cover okay. and about an acre and a half in tillage. Very cool. Um, What kind of tools do you use for the tillage outside? Well, I got a John Deere tractor that's uh, 14 years old. Okay. Uh, It's a little 2210. And uh, I have a uh, Troy-built rototiller that uh, is eventually going to change into something much better than what I have right now. Okay. You know, something that's going to work a little better inside those high hoops. Very cool. So talk to us about your background. You said you were in the military, you traveled the world, saw a whole bunch of different systems. Then obviously you came back. Did you start growing and farming right away or did it take you some time? No, I was in uh, real estate. Uh, okay. I got a great appreciation for the value of land. Mm. And, you know, there's good soil, there's bad soil, there's good locations, there's bad locations. It was, it was all part of an educational process. Mm-hmm. And during all this time, I, I looked for the place where I built my house in, for five years because the land had to be just right. Mm. You know, I wanted something that I could grow on because I, you know, I was raised on a dairy farm and I didn't want cows, but I did like working with plants. Plants don't argue with you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yes. Uh, but they're very sensitive on how, how you take care of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was looking for the perfect place. I found it and, uh, uh, 
my wife and I decided we're going to uh, do the gardening thing. Uh It it just blew up from there. Very cool. So talk to us a little bit about your sales channels. Um, You sell at the farmer's market. You you started off selling just to people that you knew. And then I think now you're at the farmer's market. Where else do you sell your product? Uh, I started off uh, just selling to people that know me, like me, and trusted me. Mm -hmm. And by word of mouth, that grew exponentially. And uh, we went to the Clarksville uh, Farmer's Market. It's a little local one that was uh, right here, but it was only good from uh, May through October. Mm. And and I was a all year round uh, production uh, facility. So I had plenty of product when they'd run out of market. And, you know, the market was good there in Clarksville, but it wasn't quite what I needed. So I moved to... Uh, Nashville, November of last year. Uh And I learned that my worst day in uh, uh, Nashville was my best day in Clarksville. Wow. Now, that must have been a little bit of a, you know, thinking about that movement, because I'm sure the fees for the Nashville market were significantly higher. Uh, 10 to 1. 10 to 1. And but you made a sense immediately with the sales increase. Yeah, and I, and I adjusted productivity uh, to match it. When I went to Nashville, I found out that uh, my, my clientele was a little more educated, a little more food sensitive. They were looking for that good, fresh farm produce with uh, uh-huh. no chemicals, uh, as close to organic as you could get it. I'm not an organic farmer because I won't go through the process. Mm-hmm. But I follow all the OMRI requirements to do organically. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. You know, I just don't have the time or inclination to have somebody walk around and inspect me. I did that for 23 years while I was in the military. Yes, yes. So now you're just customer inspected. Yeah, and and I have clients come out all the time to uh, make sure that uh, their their produce is uh, being grown properly and they they feel good about it and they continue buying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So talk to us about your recent trip to Korea. Cause I think, you know, I've seen you online for a few years now, but when I saw you started to post those pictures, I really started to geek out because I love high tunnel growing and I love, and I think you say, it depends on how they quantify them, but I'm really interested in that covered production aspect. What prompted you to take the trip over there? My first overseas assignment uh, 42 years ago now was uh, to be stationed in Korea. Uh-huh. And my first unit, uh, it was a uh, uh, military police company, and we were all assigned a Katusa partner. A Katusa is a Korean augmentation to the United States Army. It's where the uh, Korean government has given us uh, soldiers to work in our units to work both as interpreters and extra bodies for us to do our military mission. Mm-hmm. And my battle buddy was Joe. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Joe uh, Kiyun was uh, one of my best friends over there because we depended upon each other. Mm. And this last October, after a conversation on uh, online about uh, how I'm not doing things correctly, <laughs> according to the current way <laughs> yes i get that that uh, uh maybe i should come and uh over there and take a look and it, my wife had been there all oh, about 10 years prior i hadn't been back in 40 years okay and we took the trip and i found out that uh, joe was uh, uh the ceo of his own um agricultural support company he is one of the guys that actually helps farmers go from growing row crops and their their uh, uh, environment it's growing rice uh-huh. etc in in fields and, and turn, turning that into produce okay produce produ- uh, producing high ho- houses and you got to understand that Korea is about the size of Oregon oh wow and has the population of California and Oregon. Wow. Yeah. Now, consider this, that they only import 10% of their produce in the wintertime. That's how successful their program is. 
Fascinating. And what latitude are they on? They're in the exact same latitude as we are here in Tennessee. Interesting. Right. And so you basically threw him, um, he toured you around the company and country and just took you to different places that um, grew um, vegetables. I was there in October and I was amazed. Okay. Because I know how much work it, you know, I had to do to keep my stuff in October. You know, I got to replant everything in uh, August and I got to water it and all that stuff and, and get it going here in the States in my high hoop. Mm-hmm. When I got up there, I was really impressed with uh, how they were growing their produce. They'll grow cantaloupes all mm-hmm. winter long, well, up until uh, the uh, December 21st. Okay. And uh, they only harvest one cantaloupe per plant, but they're perfect. Interesting. And so they're probably, probably getting a premium price for that then. They're selling them for 10 to $15 a piece in November and December. Wow. And are those tunnels heated? Some of the uh, tunnels are heated with a uh, recirculated hot water system that goes in the ground. Okay, so only soil heat. Right. And and there's a a couple of them where they did have uh, radiators that were uh, suspended from the ceiling, but it was also hot water heated. Gotcha. The the unique thing about their... uh, greenhouses are is uh, where we in our high hoops will have one structure Mm -hmm. with uh, the W struts across the width of the greenhouse, the whole length of it to take care of the snow load, et cetera. They do one very strong outside layer. Okay. With a six millimeter uh, ply on it. And then inside, they'll have two other structures. And the distance between the walls coming in toward the center is uh, they're 20 centimeters or eight and a half inches apart. Okay. So you think of it, you got the outside layer. Yep. Eight inches in, another layer of greenhouse. And then the third and final layer on the innermost layer, another eight inches in. On the outside layer... They'll have vents in the top, and they'll have roll-up sides. Okay. And they'll roll up to the shoulders, approximately five and a half feet. Okay, yep. On the innermost, or the middle layer, they will have the capability of rolling up the uh, plastic all the way up to about three feet from the apex on either side. So you'd have a six-foot covering on the roof. Yes. Okay. Now that second layer, is that a thinner layer or still six and a half, six millimeters? Or, or no, six it's, millimeters? A, it's, a, it's like a, a two mil ply. Okay. Interesting. All right. Got that. Okay. And they're using that primarily as the insulating layer to uh-huh. give that uh, uh, eight inches of insulating value in between. And then in the innermost layer, it's a frame and they'll have a polyester blanket. Hmm. Now, consider these uh, greenhouses are about 20 meters wide. They're pretty wide. Yeah. Okay. So that would be about 30 feet wide. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And um, they're 100 meters long. Okay. So about 330 feet. Wow. Yes. And they'll have a uh, polyester ply blanket that goes all the way from the apex down to the ground on each side. Now the concept for this is in the the fall when I was there, they would uh, open air all the sides up during the day. Mm-hmm. But as the sun was starting to set, the both the outside and the uh, uh, middle layers would be lowered. Mm-hmm. And as the temperatures were starting to fall, there was a uh, thermal gauged uh, a controller that would roll out the blanket. When it's 17 degrees outside, it is 55 degrees generally inside those high hoops. Wow, that is so cool. So how cold, what's the coldest that they get in Korea? Well, I've been out there where we had uh, winters where you could... Bit and listen to your 
spittle crack before it hits the ground because it's frozen already and oh, the wow. air's warmer than the ice. Wow. And I, I've known that it's been below zero and well below zero on uh, the Celsius scale over there. Yeah. Interesting. Now, so this was automated then. So they would have like a time motor time controller for the first and second layer. And then the third layer, the blanket would just be temperature controlled. Temperature controlled and timed. Yeah. Very interesting. And I've, I've been to a couple of them where they actually had people that were out there all the time and they would do it manually. Gotcha. Okay. So the low, the low, the low automation versus the high automation. Okay. So they were doing, you talked about the, um, the cantaloupes. What other crops were they doing in these? Well, they were growing squash, cucumbers. Um, they had, uh, uh, Chinese cabbage. They had strawberries. Strawberries were really intriguing to me Mm -hmm. because they were, their, their cycle for the strawberries would be in August. Mm-hmm. They would uh, plant all the re- refrigerated runners that they collected and get them propagated, rooted, and then transfer them in September into the grow-out trays. Okay. And these were uh, just short of 100 meters long. Uh, they're uh, eight inch wide. They're filled with uh, the cocoa growing mm-hmm. substratus and uh, they would uh, uh, have them every eight inches in two rows. Okay. And those, so it's like a hydroponic system or kind of like a hybrid system. Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's a hybrid system where they're growing in a uh, stratus, a mm-hmm. natural stratus. And then they would have the uh, uh, drip lines running down the length of the uh, mm-hmm. trays with, um, you know, the time to nutrients come in. I yeah. that in the bottom of each two of the trays, there was a recirculating tube in there that uh, they would have the warm water coming in. And, oh, interesting. Yeah, so they, they wanted to keep the ground warm. They wanted to keep the ground around 60 degrees. Yep. And they wanted the fruit that hung on the outside of the trays to be in the air in the evenings around... 50 to 55 because it's the coolness that actually causes the um, sugars in the strawberries to develop. Oh, very interesting. Now with the strawberries, were they using any lights during the winter time? Did they talk at all about that? These are all day neutrals. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. All right. So you've talked about, did you see any like uh, tunnels with like actually greens or anything like that? Or is that just not high enough value for them? No, they, they had, everything out there okay they grew everything you got to think about that uh most of the diet of the korean people are are vegetables gotcha where they were we have to have meat in just about every one of our meals Mm -hmm. they're they're pretty good with uh, having meat in 20 percent of their meals so talk to me a little bit about the do they have snow over there and and how did they manage the tunnels for snow is it just that one big heavy duty beam or bow that's holding that up that primary outside uh, frame Mm -hmm. takes their snow load and they usually have uh, about four inches when it does snow up to a maximum about eight inches okay and if it gets too thick they go out there and they scrape the uh, outsides to cause the, these tunnels to fall, to shed the snow. And consider these are all Quonset style. There are very mm-hmm. few of them that are uh, gabled. Yep. And that, that's their, their, their primary. And you, you also have to look at how they set them up. They set them up in an array of five. And okay. what that means is they'll have five of these uh, uh, greenhouses side by side, and they'll be about two feet apart. Okay. Between each one of them, there'll be a common drain. Okay, yep. It'll be like a French drain. So all the water goes down to the uh, downhill side, and they collect that up and uh, uh, reuse it. Um, on the uh, far end, on the uphill end of the, uh, the tubes, they have another greenhouse that is set up where all five of those greenhouses come into the main building. Like a head house. 
Yeah, exactly, a head house. And that's where all the fertigation, all the heat, because they use it, uh, um, boilers to mm -hmm. uh, heat the water. And they'll have a 20,000 gallon tank in there for the warm water. Fascinating. That's a huge tank. It, it's, it's, it's a good uh, 15 feet tall. Okay. And it, it takes up pretty much the whole center of the house. But uh, they, they use uh, that as a reservoir for the heat. Interesting. And it's dark color, so they get solar passive heating on it as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think I saw a picture of you showing mushrooms in these houses as well. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, uh, the, what, what they do there, that, that is a whole different process. They use okay. the same, same uh, houses, the construction of the houses, but they uh, mix their, uh, their growing media differently. Okay. okay. They, they use uh, wood fibers and they have a lot of filbert trees over there. So they grind those up. Okay. And mix it with a peat or a cocoa uh, uh, stratus to mix it up. And then they put it through a machine that compresses them and puts them into a bag. And they're, they're about uh, four inches diameter and they're a good 10 inches tall. Okay. They autoclave those to sterilize them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Go into this large room where they're, they're heated with steam for uh, 48 hours. Then they go into a clean room where they're inoculated. Okay. With whatever variety of uh, uh, mushrooms are growing in the, uh, the one I was in, those were shiitakes. Yep. Once they're inoculated, then they are moved into a, Another room, they're kept at, uh, I think it was 85 degrees and a good 80% relative humidity to allow them to develop. Mm -hmm. And once they've been in there for approximately four or five months, they move them out into the greenhouses and uh, they start producing the, the mushrooms. And to increase the number of harvests, they'll shock in between. Interesting. It's shocking with cold water. And uh, uh, then they'll let them go back into the process. And those blocks, they'll, they'll use them for a good 18 months before they recycle them again. Very cool. And then do those have white plastic on those tunnels or are they just clear like everything else? No, actually, uh, those uh, tunnels were covered in a triple density black shade cloth. Oh, interesting. They were they were dark inside. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so was the shade cloth like so that air exchanged through? Yeah. Okay, interesting. And water through, or is the water kept out? Water was kept out. Okay, very interesting. Got it. Cool. So, what would you say your biggest takeaway from your trip over there was? Not get locked into doing something the way you're taught because you think that's the only way to do it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, be open to others' ideas, be willing to experiment on the equipment you have here to see how you can adapt what you have to make it work. Mm -hmm. So are you thinking of like adjusting your tunnels with any of those features or just that the parts aren't available in the U.S.? Well, all the parts are available. All, of it, all they're using is a uh, uh, bendable pipe. Gotcha. So it's just a matter of bending it. Right. I can convert my current uh, high hoop, but I have a contract with USDA for another year before I can do anything to it. Gotcha. And what about the blankets? Is that something that can be imported or is already being built for used for something else in the U.S.? Well, I have uh, uh, talked to the guys that uh, made them mm -hmm. and they can make them, tailor make them to my needs and the shipping cost would be like 300 bucks freight. Okay. To, from Korea to the States. For one greenhouse setup? Yeah. That's not bad at all. Well, the, the blanket for a 100-meter uh, greenhouse is going to be $6,000. $6,000. Whew. Okay. Well, that's... But, uh... <laughs> you got you to you put it in perspective, okay? Yeah. If, if they're growing strawberries, 
their yeah. net their net per 100 meters is twenty six thousand dollars. That's oh, net. Wow. Net. net. Wow. You know, he he showed me the whole spreadsheet. He showed you know. Yeah. Because that's what he his his job is to put these uh, uh, greenhouses together, give advisors to the farmers mm -hmm. for their first season, and to mm -hmm walk them through the process until he can say, okay, you guys got it. And they leave. It's a program that's uh, paid 50% by the government of South Korea and 50% by the farmer. Yeah. That I, you know, we need more programs like that. I mean, cause you know, I think that the current high tunnel program that the NRCS has, it's great because it's getting tunnels out to a bunch more farmers. But the one lacking part is it doesn't come along with information on how to use those tunnels. And so often I see after a couple of years, them just abandoned because people really did not know what they were doing. So I think that's a, a downfall of that program, even though I think the rest of the program is great because it's just getting tunnels out there. Yeah. Well, as part of one of my goals is to uh, marry up with uh, Tennessee State University, their agricultural department there in Nashville, mm -hmm. and uh, do some studies with them to see how effective it's going to be to bring this type of product to um, uh, Tennessee and mm -hmm. produce winter crops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that could be really, really cool. Do they, you know what the, so you said when it's, uh, 17 degrees out, it's 50 degrees inside. Do you know when it hits zero degrees out, what it ends up being inside? They, they still maintain it. It uh, stays within uh, the uh, temperature requirements for growing produce. Okay. It, it doesn't freeze in there and it doesn't get below 40. It's going to uh, retard any real growth on any of the greens or the strawberries or the, uh, um, the squash and stuff like that, the ones that need the, the real heat yep. to grow, they are done by December. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And then for like to say the greens, are they putting some of that, that water heat in, in there in the ground? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. All right. So that's part of the system. Part of the system is that they're keeping the ground warmer from that hot water. The other part is that really thick, thick blanket, which is coming down on things as well. Right. If, if you see any of the pictures on, uh, my Facebook or my Instagram, where they show the ground plants, they're all in high raised beds. Mm -hmm. okay. they, all, they all have the, uh, uh, the tubes, the heating tubes running the length of uh, those rows in the dirt. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, we will, in the show notes of this episode, we will drop some pictures or at least a link to that so people can see those as well. I have, I have additional photos. Okay, yeah, if you just want to share those, I'll make sure they get into the show notes so that when people go to thrivingfarmerpodcast.com, they can just um, click right there and, and see all those photos you got. Sounds cool. Good. Cool. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, you're doing, uh, I think, some deep bed technology as well as just other hydroponic type in your greenhouse. Do you want to talk a little bit about those systems? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've been working on a deep water culture bed. Uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to... Uh, start growing watercress. Now I can do watercress in the uh, NFTs. Yep. Mm -hmm. But the water temperature gets a little warm in months mm. their growth. Using a uh, uh, deep water culture, I think I can uh, better regulate the temperature mm -hmm. of the growing water. Uh, and I also have a cooler that I was going to put into the recirculating system for it. Okay. And uh, that way I'll be able to provide a better product, end product when it goes to the market. Mm -hmm. oh. And it, pr it probably keeps it warmer in the winter too with that much mass. Correct. And it's just another item that will help keep my greenhouse at a constant temperature. Mm-hmm, 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 gotcha. So then what's the kind of like turnaround for your NFT channels? How often are you harvesting lettuce out of those? Well, my growth cycle is approximately six weeks. Okay. It'll go seven weeks in the wintertime. Okay. And then you're heating that house? I have natural gas. Natural gas. Okay. Gotcha. And what temperature do you try to keep that up that the winter? Are you trying to actually heat heat or just prevent them from freezing? No. Um, I'm also growing peppers in there currently. Okay. 
and uh, I keep the uh, low temperature at 60 degrees. Gotcha. Okay. Got it. And are you adding any winter light to that as well? Or is it just natural sunlight? We're all natural sunlight here. I am fortunate to be at the latitude where I get uh, a minimum of 14 lumens. Okay. Yep. Of light per, per day. And uh, it makes me happy. There's a couple of uh, days in a, in a month where I'll, I'll be short that, but you know, that's why I have that extra week in my growing cycle. Gotcha. Okay. So you can just naturally slow down a little bit. Gotcha. Right. So, you know, who would you say your mentors were as you were starting building out your farm? Well, I read a lot of books. Okay. And one of the uh, uh, most interesting ones that I read was a uh, 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 hydroponic publication. And gee, now I, I'm, I'm getting old and I'm forgetting the, the name of the lady that uh, wrote it, but it was on hydroponic lettuce. Okay. And so that really resonated with you. And then you're like, I can do this. Yeah. And I, I went out to, to some of the, my neighbor farms in Kentucky where the, the Amish mm-hmm. are growing hydroponic uh, tomatoes and other uh, products uh, for produce. And I went out there and I talked with them. And they said, the ground is going to tell you what you can do. Mm. Uh, God is going to give you the gift so you can do it. The rest of it's all based on faith. Go out there Mm -hmm. and do the best you can. Hmm. That's very cool. Well, you know, if you you think about it, you know, every time you plant a seed is a chance Mm -hmm. that it's going to do something or it's not. Yeah. And it's just like talking with people, okay? You can plant an idea where it can spread or you can plant an idea where it will die. But uh, it's all about just doing the right thing, being consistent, being good to your people. My customers come from miles around to Nashville. Mm-hmm. We, we have a very uh, steady, regular group, even in the middle of winter, that are showing up to get our produce. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, thinking of back over your farm and the kind of, as you put it together, if there's like a magic reset button as it relates to starting your farm, what systems or processes would you go back and put into place sooner rather than later? Sooner. I would have done all this 10 years sooner. Okay. You would have just gotten in sooner. Right. Uh, because the, the, the worst part about uh, uh, what I've done is, is my age. Okay. I got to hire more people because mm-hmm. I can't do as much as I used to. Right, right now I have uh, two 16-year-olds that are homeschooled. Okay. And they work for me every morning or every uh, no, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings for the, the first four hours of the day. Now they get to get credit for their horticulture, science classes, et cetera, mm-hmm. by working with me because I sign off on their curriculum. Very cool. I and, call that a win-win. Yeah, and they get paid. So it's a win-win for them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. You know, I was homeschooled too, and I wish I'd had an opportunity like that um, to actually, you know, do some like, um, I guess you'd call it, you know, kind of like uh, apprenticing kind of. Yeah. And, and you think about it, when I went to Korea, I left the responsibility of a half a million dollar operation to two 16-year-olds. Wow. Yeah. And uh, how did it go? They exceeded my wildest dreams. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, yeah. I, I thought I was going to have to start over on everything after being out of the net for a month. Yeah. But it also, I think, goes to how you've set up your systems and your processes. Obviously, you've, been, you've trained them well. Uh, yeah. And we take notes and we compare notes and we do lessons learned and after actions where we mm-hmm. say, what could we have done better next time? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Because I know finding good people is, is very tough. How'd you find these two 16 year olds? They're neighbors. Okay. So they just happen to be neighbors. That's awesome. I, I was very fortunate. Mm-hmm. And with that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with Charles Pekka. 
If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. We are back here with Charles Pekka from Morningstar Farm. In You're outside of Nashville, correct? Yeah, we're in Adams, Tennessee. Adams, Tennessee. Very cool. So let's talk a little bit about your marketing. You're at the farmer's market. Do you have other additional farm channels that you're selling through? Do you sell online at all or through email or is it mainly through the farmer's markets and at your farm? Well, we, we have our at the farm market where we have our local clientele come and visit us. Okay. It's on a call-in basis. We also use Shopify. Okay. But it's on a pickup basis where we're not uh, shipping anything to anybody yet. Okay. So they have to place the order and then they will come and pick it when it's up, when it's ready. Right. If, if they place the order and they, they want to come to the Nashville Farmer's Market, it'll be packaged their name on it. They walk in, identify themselves, grab and go. Okay. And some people, they, they like that, that convenience because they're in, they're out. They're not waiting on parking or trying to run through the masses. They, you know, they know mm-hmm. it. We do a lot of marketing uh, at the uh, farmer's market with pictures. And we, we do a teaching session where we will talk to people about how to use our products. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife's from Korea, and she's what I call a specialist in Korean foods. And she's always teaching her uh, uh, customers on how to use the food properly, how to cook it properly, so you get the, the greatest amount of nutrition. Nutritional. Mm-hmm. We also uh, have our Instagram site and our uh, business page on Facebook. We don't have the uh, website per se, uh, other than what our Shopify site is. And currently I need to update that because we got more produce to put on there. Mm -hmm. That's something we have to do every Thursday regardless. Uh, One of the promises we have to our uh, clients is what they're buying is picked Wednesday or Thursday every week. Mm. And what we don't sell uh, it's not like we package it up and, uh, and try to sell it again. Most of it goes to um, Loaves and Fishes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a uh, charity here in uh, in town, uh, and it, it gets redistributed out and fed to uh, homeless, et cetera. Very cool. Um, what products sell the best for you? If I were to look at my spreadsheet right now, they would tell me it would be lettuce. Mm-hmm followed by uh, our tomatoes last uh, summer that we grew outside in the high hoop. Mm -hmm. And then we had a squash, or I'm I'm sorry, it's a melon, a Korean melon called a chalme. Okay. It's a little yellow uh, melon the size of a large cucumber. Okay. And they're real sweet like a honeydew. Okay. Like, are they also known as like a sun jewel? I know Johnny's for a while sold one that was kind of like long oblong. Yeah, they're, they're similar. Okay. You know, we, we, we get a lot of our seeds from Korea, so we, we're able to uh, sell the, the actual genuine. Gotcha. Now, is that relatively easy to import those? Or do you have to be kind of uh, sneaky about that? No, it's, it's pretty much straightforward as long as the they're they're not a uh, plant that's on their disease list. So you're also doing like I saw kimchi. Are you doing that in house? Are you doing that at a, a 20C kitchen? How are you b- doing that? 
Well, we have a uh, uh, commercial kitchen space that we uh, use there at the farmer's market. Okay. We'll, we'll mix it up and uh, refrigerate. I got a walk-in cooler uh, that I recently purchased for our booth at the uh, farmer's market so we can uh, store the products in there to start the uh, fermentation process for the kimchi. And yeah, we sell a lot of kimchi. Very cool. And I saw pictures of daikon radish, um, Chinese cabbage. What other ingredients go into kimchi? Uh, the peppers. Okay. Garlic. And, and we grow both of those. I don't, I don't usually sell garlic because we just grow enough to make our own kimchi out of. Yeah. And, and that's usually a, a row that's uh, 100 feet long by 10 feet wide. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of garlic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is. Well, when I come visit Nashville, I'm going to have to pick some of that up because that sounds absolutely amazing. Well, we, we will have it as long as we still harvest uh, Chinese cabbage in uh, the daikon radishes, because uh, of the Department of Agriculture here in uh, Tennessee, we can only sell those items that we actually uh, grow. Oh, interesting. So it's that from the farmers market. That's right. what the rules of the farmer's market are. Interesting. Even if it's a processed product. Right. If, if we don't grow 90% of the uh, materials in there, we can't sell it as a farm product. See, the, when you're buying from the farm in the state of Tennessee, direct farmer to consumer, there's mm-hmm. no sales tax. Oh, interesting. But the minute, the minute we change or we're buying from somebody else, or we're putting more than 90% of the ingredients in it, then we have to charge a sales tax on it. And we have to be able to prove. Very cool. I did not know that. That's, that's new for me. So let's talk about beginning farmers. You've been doing this for a while now, um, and you probably see farmers come and go around you. What do you feel the biggest mistake that beginning farmers make is? Find a market for your products. Mm. do some forward looking before you start growing. Mm -hmm. I say that because there's a lot of people that decided to grow hemp Mm -hmm. last year, a lot of my neighbors and they got barns of it. That's rotting because they had nobody to sell it to. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because everybody jumped on the bandwagon. So whether you're growing produce, hemp, whatever product, whether it beef, whatever, sit down and do a business plan. Mm-hmm. Do the research that you need to do to find out where your customer base is. A lot of my, my products that I grow are Asian-based foods, vegetables, et cetera, because they're not here. And there's a large Korean population in uh, Clarksville and Nashville. Mm-hmm a large Japanese and Chinese uh, population in Nashville. Some of the uh, products that we grow are just not common on the market. They're unique, like some of the baby bok choy that we, we grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, as soon as we harvest it, it's pretty much sold. Wow. And so those are all seeds coming from Korea? Well, those seeds come from Johnny's. Gotcha. Okay. For your Korean uh, crops, do you have a seed company over there you recommend, or is it just by knowing the right people who have it? No, there, there's a couple of them that uh, we use. Okay. And the, the easiest one to get the seeds from that if uh, you're really looking for the right product, I think it's uh, Kitsawa Seeds. Okay. You can send that to me later if you get a chance. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. I'll, I'll link that to you. They have most of the Asian seeds. Okay for growing the, the right Chinese cabbage, the right daikon radishes, et cetera. Mm, you know, gotcha. there, there, are, there are specific strains that just don't taste right. Gotcha. So these are built for flavor for the right, for the kimchi and for the, the, the right products. Right. You know, it, it's just like, uh, you know, Johnny's may have had the, the sun gold melons. Yeah. They don't have many more, probably because they weren't the right ones. Well, and another thing about those, those squash or the melons are is you have to uh, graft the rootstock. Oh, interesting. Tell me more about that. 
the rootstock for chame is kind of weak and they're real susceptible to bores and all sorts of little bugs that get into them. Okay. We use a pumpkin rootstock. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, when we'll plant the, uh, the chow mein melons a, a week ahead of the uh, pumpkins. And when uh, the pumpkins are up and they have the uh, two seed leaves mm-hmm. and they're starting to grow the third leaf, we will slice and graft the chow mein uh, seedling on top of it. Now, we'll do a couple hundred at a time because I'm going to have maybe 25% of them mm-hmm. that don't catch. But, you know, that's the cost of doing business. Yeah, very cool. I knew that you, that, that was out there being done, that people were grafting melons. But that's really interesting that the reason for that is because the high quality fruit is on such a weak plant that you need to just give it the vigor. You need to give it a better rootstock for, for it to produce and give us the size that we want. It's still the same chame. Yeah. But they're, they're healthier. They look gotcha. better. If you could pick one, what do you feel is your favorite farming tool? Hmm. My favorite farming tool. Even though I was looking at the questions before, uh, this, this is one that I really had to think of. And the one that's probably given me the, the best results for the dollars that I put into it was our uh, uh, flame weeder that we got. Very cool. Uh, it's, it's like uh, planting carrots. Okay, we're, we're putting in carrots this next week. Mm-hmm. after the 15th what we'll do is uh we'll we'll till up the dirt mm-hmm. we'll put the seeds in then we're going to cover it with a uh, black uh, uh weed barrier and mm-hmm. keep it wet five days uh from the day that we put it down we're going to pull it up and we're going to hit it with the flame weeder mm-hmm. because with the heat from the uh uh uh, weed barrier, it's going to make all those other weed seeds germinate. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to come over it with the uh, flame weeder, burn them off. And my carrots take about a week to 10 days to germinate. Mm-hmm. So I've killed off all the competition before they started sprouting. Very cool. And what brand of flame weeder do you like? Oh, see, I bought it right here in Tennessee. I'll have to send that one to you too. All right, cool. And maybe a farmer's friend? They're, Absolutely. They're in t- That's them. Okay, cool. Yeah, they're good folks down there. Cool. All right, so where can people find more about you and your farm? Well, we're uh, on Morningstar Farm, where great salads are born on Facebook. Okay. And we're on Instagram at Morningstar Farm TN. Gotcha. Well, Charles, thank you again so much for taking the time um, to talk to me today and and, uh, share your story and uh, your trip to uh, Korea. And uh, I'm super excited about the possibilities of seeing some of these in the U.S. And, uh, you know, keep us updated absolutely with, you know, if you start playing with this and start importing some of this. Absolutely. You'll be one of the first people to see the photos. All right, cool. Again, thank you, Charles. You're welcome. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer Podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.